Hello and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport. These are the females who have knocked down the barriers to challenge the status quo for women and girls across the world. I'm so excited to introduce my guest today, but before I do, I'd like to thank Barclays for once again sponsoring this series of The Game Changers, which features fearless women in football. Few brands have done more for women's sport. Barclays is a title sponsor of the Women's Super League, and they also back the FA in the fantastic work it does to ensure that every schoolgirl across the country will have a chance to play football by 2024. My guest today is Amanda Vandervoort, the Chief Women's Football Officer at FIFPRO, the Global Football Players Union. Amanda is a soccer player and coach whose previous roles include Vice President of Fan Engagement at Major League Soccer. In 2016, Amanda was President of United Soccer Coaches and she also serves on the boards of several global organisations dedicated to transforming communities through soccer. I began by asking Amanda about how much soccer played a part in her life growing up. Wow, soccer was central to my life growing up. Let me qualify that a little bit. It was central when I turned maybe 13, right? Because all my friends were playing soccer. So I wanted to participate and be part of like the things that, that they were doing. And and for an American, a p- pretty late bloomer when it came to my, my soccer career. I played a little bit. I dabbled in some recreational leagues when, when I was much younger, but I hated it. I hated it because I'm in Arizona and it's sweaty and it's super hot. It's 110 degrees outside. I I didn't love it. So when I got to be a little bit older, 13-ish, just on the verge of of high school, for me, it became a really social inclusion opportunity. Definitely added like um, health to my life and, and a little bit more kind of well-roundedness for, for me as a person. It offered me a bit of an escape from a, what I felt was a, a challenging family life. Um, my parents are divorced and I was living with my mom in Arizona and I just found serenity. I found serenity in soccer and in and in training and in committing myself to, to something. Yeah. So, I mean, since then I got really competitive about it and it became my, it's be, become my life since then. But I think It's a little bit of the social aspect, but also, yeah, like it created a space for me to really flourish as a kid. And how did it play a part in your pathway through school and then through college? I I believe you're a product Mm -hmm. of of Title IX. So it's interesting from the UK because we don't have that here, but in terms of how that assisted your progress, really. Yeah, you know, for for a couple of years, I was doing consulting for FIFA, and I was traveling around to different regions and different countries, and trying to help them think about the development of of women's football, how to market it, how to grow the sport in their countries. And one of the things that I always found fascinating was that people didn't know about the history of Title IX in America and the impact that that had on women's sport, women's equality, you know, the the women's movement, I think quite broadly. So so I reflect a lot on it in that, yeah, I, I think I am a, a product of, of Title IX. It's a weird term to use, but I, I do see myself as that. I was mm. I was quite fortunate. So you know, I started, like I said, I started playing a little bit later, like in my teenage years, I got really, really competitive. One day I was actually in, I'm from Tucson, Arizona, right? And it, it gets really, really hot on the street here, like really hot. You can't go outside without shoes. So one day I was jumping from palm tree, like outside of my house, there was this shade from the palm trees and you could jump from one shade to the next shade to the next shade to get to the mailbox <laughs> without burning your feet. Right. So I, I remember one day I did that. It was in the dead hot of summer and I opened the mailbox and there was one flyer in there and it was a card for Tony DeChico's goalkeeper school. And I was, a, I was a goalkeeper. And so I saw this little like note card and I thought, oh my God, I want to do that so bad. That sounds super cool. I want to go to San Diego and I want to train to be the best goalkeeper I can possibly be. And I went inside and my mom said, you can't afford it we can't afford this. I'm single mother. My mom was a waitress. Um, there was no way we could, you know, put together the money to pay for the camp and get me to San Diego. So I went door to door and I started knocking on doors and asking for donations. And I kept a list of everyone who donated me $20 to get to soccer plus goalkeeper school. Yeah. And, uh, and I ended up pulling together enough money to pay for camp. And then I paid my mom for the gas (laughs) to get to, to get to San Diego and, and for her to get back ultimately. Yeah. So, so that was, that was a pretty 
a central moment for me in like understanding ROI also, like yeah. if I'm going to camp, I got to make the most of it, right? A bit of crowdfunding there as I well. A bit of crowdfunding. Yeah. I learned, I was, I was way out of, of like the crowdfunding websites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that kicked me off on my, my journey to think about collegiate soccer. So I was in high school and I was starting to look at these opportunities. Now, again, Title IX was 1972. So this is still 15 years on. And we're just at this point starting to see opportunities open up for girls and women to play collegiate athletics. I thought, wow, there's opportunity for me to go to college, get a scholarship through this sport that now I've fallen in love with. Like I got to get the most out of my goalkeeper school that I possibly can and win the starting spot on the varsity team and then continue on that that path and that journey. And, you know, since then we've seen, I mean, I think that's one of the things that makes soccer in America for girls such a powerful and unique space is the opportunities provided as a result of this government intervention of Title IX. So when I'm bringing it back full circle to the work that I've done in, in some of this consulting and now the work that I'm doing today with FIFPRO, which I'm sure we'll get into in a little bit, it really is foundational, this idea of government intervention and the importance that community is collectively understands the role and value of women in society and, and creates measures, governance and policy and, and measures that ultimately al- allow it to happen. So a little girl like me who, you know, is skipping from palm tree shade to palm (laughs) tree shade and sees this little card, can use that as a springboard to a career now dedicated to sport, to soccer. And do you think at the time you wanted to work in sport when you were that, uh, not even at the young age, but as you're going through school and college, was that a dream for you? No, 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 no. I... I (laughs) (laughs) my, My mom's an artist. She's like a casual artist. And, um, she did like oil paintings and stuff. And she made, when she divorced my dad, she made these um, dolls, like soft sculpture dolls. We used to travel. We have this thing in, in the United States. It's um, like craft fairs. I don't know if you do them in, in, in the UK the same way, right? Like in a big conference convention center. And my mom used to make this booth for, for her dolls. And we would dress it up like the North Pole. And my brother, who was seven years older than me and six foot tall, she would dress us both up as elves. <laughs> and we had these shoes that had these like hooks and bells that hung off the front. And my mom, <laughs> my mom was dressed up like Mrs. Claus. And we would have the booth with all of the dolls. <laughs> <laughs> and and sell dolls. We would go on the circuit in the summers, right? And and sell dolls for her business. But I guess I'm I'm getting to the point. I was very art. I was very crafty. I was very driven by like arts and crafts, right? So and I was a drawer and a painter, and I have this kind of creative spirit about me. Oh, because you do cakes. So you do cakes now. I do cakes on Instagram. Yeah. So, like, what's that? That's my. That's like my dream. My dream job is making <laughs> cakes in the celebration of a locker room of the World Cup. <laughs> like imagine, imagine you go into the World Cup final. You've just won the World Cup final. You go into the locker room. Of course, there's champagne and sponsored product, but there's a huge cake in there to celebrate, <laughs> like the Vandy cake in the locker room one day. Anyway, yeah. So that's my creative side. That cake is just another medium. But anyway, so when I was a kid, this is how long, how long do we have for this interview? Cause I, <laughs> so when I was a kid, I, I, cre- I made, I entered this mothers against drunk driving contest. You know, you, you basically, you had to draw a picture of like why you shouldn't drink and drive. And I had drawn this history book and like a car crashing into the history book. And it said, you know, don't drink and drive or you'll be history. Right. Like that was in like the fifth grade. I was like 10 years old or something. Right. And Anyway, I won. I won this competition in all of my city, all of Tucson. And they put it on a billboard out actually where the professional oh. team plays now. It was like up on this billboard out on Ajo Way, if you know, Tucson. And I was so proud of like having my work up on this billboard. So I fantasized for the rest of my high school and collegiate career of designing billboards. Like that was my dream mm-hmm. job. Like I was going to design billboards. So when I went to college, I studied communications and layout and design, newspaper layout and design, because it was in the 90s, right? So digital media was just kind of becoming a thing. Yeah. So no, I was all about layout and design and communications and like media formats and stuff. No, football wasn't, soccer wasn't my like career path, but, but I'm thankful it is. <laughs> How did you find yourself? What was that? What was that first role then into sport in the sports world? 
Yeah. Well, I was a coach. I was a coach. I, I consider myself a coach first. Like I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. I'm a coach. I love soccer coaching. I love soccer coaches in the community. So I've coached since I started playing. Actually, I started um, when I was, you know, I started a little bit later. Uh, there was a guy, Don, I don't remember his last name. His name was Don. And he invited me to come out and coach the little kids. Like while I was learning to play soccer, I also went out and started coaching like the little girls how to be goalkeepers because I had all this education now from from Soccer Plus. So I was kind of instilling that, imparting that on the little kids. So coaching has just always been part of my journey in whatever respect. When I was in high school, I was, you know, coaching. When I was in college, I was coaching um, like a youth club. I went to college in Wyoming and I coached a youth club there while I was while I was getting my my degree, my undergrad. And boys and girls, coaching boys and girls? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And then um and then I went to so my college sweetheart and I decided we were gonna move to New Jersey. Cause his dad had a horse farm in New Jersey and we figured out this arrangement where we could we could live on this farm. So we, we, we packed all our stuff in a U-Haul and, uh, and, and moved East. And my coach at University of Wyoming at the time said, listen, I know a great program in New Jersey. They just won the national championship in division three soccer. She said, I think you should look into it because it's a teacher's college and they have a program in educational technology, which is what I had really learned to aspire to. So running the computer lab, right? Or like teaching other teachers how to use assistive technologies or how to do online learning, right? Like how relevant is this today? Like it couldn't be more relevant that the world of Zoom is so relevant to my education and, and <laughs> teaching. But anyway, so I we, we decided, yeah, the College of New Jersey is interesting. I called up the coach. He said, no, we've never really had anyone from outside New Jersey as part of the program. They're like uh, this amazing program. I mean, they might've had a couple people come through, but but they're really like New Jersey centric and unbelievably successful. So I said, listen, I'm going to apply. I really want the job. By the way, I'm on I-80. That's the interstate that goes across the U.S. I said, I'm on I-80. I'll be there next week. So let me know. (laughs) Anyway, uh, that uh, long story short, I didn't get the job for a while. I ended up getting a real estate license in New Jersey, sold real estate around Princeton, (laughs) kicked around in, in that for a little bit before he finally was like, okay, listen, like we want you here at the College of New Jersey. So that was my first kind of coaching job was as a graduate assistant. So it paid, again, soccer paid for my education. It paid for my master's degree, um, which I was, I felt really, really fortunate um, to be there with, with this, the coach, Joe Russo is his name. And he was just an unbelievable mentor and friend to me still. Um, and then after that, yeah, I went to, I, I was 24 hired as the head coach at NYU after I, after I left that job, which is a, a quite a prestigious university, you know, in, in New York division three soccer and a very, very competitive league. So that's where I got my feet wet really as a head coach, figuring out how to coach people that are the same age as, as me and incredibly, incredibly smart at NYU. I mean, it was, it was an amazing <laughs> time, but quite a challenge. And why did you leave coaching? Why was that not a career for you to to continue on? You know, I don't feel like I've ever left coaching. Like coaching is my heart and my like, it's like, it's just who I am. And that's hard to describe. I get on with coaches. I get them. I love coaching. So, but I left it as my profession in 2007 because I felt that I had outgrown my position. I wanted to kind of lean into my background and experience in technology. I wanted to leave New York City at the time. New York had just, it was grinding me, it's grinding me. You know, I'm a young head coach, not making a lot of money on the grind, um, you know, on the subway with like a bag of soccer balls and <laughs> like, and a bag of, of emergency equipment. Like it, it was heavy, you know, it's, yeah. it's tough. Like I really, people who work in a in challenging soccer environments, like I really feel for them because you really have to work. Like I was negotiating hours and time with cities and uh, driving a 15 passenger van up the road and getting caught in Lincoln tunnel traffic and having to cancel practice like at least once a week. It was nuts. I just decided it was time to explore something, something different. So my college sweetheart and I were no longer together. And then I moved to California and I helped with a startup that was called Coach Smart with this great guy who was just finishing his master's degree in Berkeley. And he runs a organization in the Bay area called Bay area scores, which is like poetry slams and soccer for inner city 
kids, like super cool program, super cool guy. But we had this idea that we could create an online library of downloadable practice plans for coaches, right? Because I knew all the coaches and he knew all the tech and the business yeah. side. And we thought, hang on, like there's a real future for this because coaches need inspiration. They need tips. So after I left, I moved to California. I didn't, I mean, I didn't have the job when I moved. I, I, I moved in with a, a friend um, in San Francisco. And then I, I kind of sought out this guy and together we formed this little business. So that kind of kept me, kept me in the mix until WPS, the women's pro league here in the United States, I started to hear rumblings that it was coming back and, and found my way to get involved in that. But yeah, I mean, that's ultimately why I left coaching and what I did right after. So wait, you, you mentioned the uh, women's professional soccer. So what was your first role there? What role did you take there? Well, the first thing I did was actually go to Chicago Red Stars. That's a, a, one of the teams in WPS. And I helped them launch. I helped them get started. So I was <laughs> I, I was the director of marketing, website, and camps <laughs> at the Chicago Red Stars, working for a guy called Peter Wilt, who I found so much inspiration from because he was... Um, at the time in, in American soccer, we had this, these message boards called big soccer. And it's basically where everyone went to like, you know, talk gossip about soccer. So anyway, Peter (laughs) was the general manager of the Chicago fire at the time before he did the red stars. And he was so open and authentic as a general manager on this board. And he would just tell fans or whoever went on, here's what's happening. And here's why I'm doing it. And, you know, drew some criticism over the years, but I found it really inspirational. And I loved this idea that an owner or a a manager or somebody in an executive position could be so open and honest and transparent. And that actually like launched my journey into social media because once like social media kind of demonstrated this ability to have two-way conversations without an intermediary, right? And I think Peter was really inspirational and foundational for me in, in thinking about thinking about executive leadership, maybe a little bit differently. So yeah, so I went to Chicago Red Stars. I helped launch that club. Uh, I mean, obviously, as the head of camps, I think that's where the, you know, the make money side of things had to come in and WPS and then the marketing is the spend money side. So (laughs) I kind of, kind of had a role in in both pieces of it. Um, But I left to go back to the league office and just right before the the, the season kicked off in in early 2009. So I spent most of my time in WPS at, at the league office. Um, which was back in San Francisco. And what was the profile like? I guess just taking us back there over a decade ago, but what was the profile like for, for women's soccer? And did you see it grow in the time that, that you were there? Mm, the profile of women's soccer was, um, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, I'll be really domestic about this answer, like really American based because we had already had a professional league. I mean, remember 99 and the women's world cup here and the Rose bowl and Brandy Chastain and the whole, like the whole story, the, the, this like legacy that we have for soccer and in America and how those women led really the, the global effort, but really here in America, like we all, I don't know, have a little piece of that in our hearts, I think um, in one way or another. And, and so there's, a, there's a bit of a legacy here for it. I'll also say that, you know, the, the title nine impact and this idea of being a product of title nine, that girls and women's soccer was growing. It was certainly growing. You saw more participation. In fact, women's soccer has now today become a, a part. Well, I mean, soccer broadly is, is a partic- participation sport in America. And our challenge isn't as working in the professional industry. Our challenge is, is less about about trying to get numbers of people playing. It's more about trying to get them watching and becoming fans, yeah, right? Yeah. And and that fandom being part of the DNA, it's a little bit different than you see in England or you see in some of these other countries where, um, you know, clubs are rooted in culture. So we had that legacy. We also had WUSA, WUSA, which was the first professional league here um, that formed as a result of, of the success of the Women's World Cup. Um, and lasted for for a couple of years. So we had a little bit of legacy in professional soccer. And I think launching WPS was at a time when when all those things had had come back together and we'd created this this business model that we felt it was independent. It was this independent business model, not based on on men's on men's soccer at the time. But what we didn't account for, I think, was the impact of the two thousand and eight financial crisis and the long-term implications of trying to challenge for the entertainment dollar in a landscape where, you know, 
gasoline is is five dollars a gallon, right? So we had I've had Mary Harvey on the podcast in a previous yeah. series too. So yeah, she relayed that too. Oh, what a great, what great! Uh, that's amazing. Mary is she's doing amazing things in this world, and and she's just such a champion for for not only women's rights, but I mean, as you know, her role at the Center for Sport and Human Rights. She's just unbelievable. She's yeah. a she was my um she was our chief operating officer. Yeah, when I was at at um at WPS, WPS. and she's um absolutely brilliant. So it's super cool. I'm honored to share the odd <laughs> squad with uh, Miss with <laughs> and, and how important you talk about social media. So how important do you think the growth of women's soccer has been tied into that growth of social media? Because it kind of ran at that parallel time, really. Uh, I love that you. Uh, so uh, yes, yes. When I <laughs> when I when I started, I remember there was in 2008. We had the U.S. Women's National Team allocation. So basically, you have your roster of of national team players, and then you kind of draw from a hat, or however they did it at the time, and distribute the the players to each of the teams in the league. Right? It wasn't like a live event; no one would cover it. The press didn't really understand it. We were this startup league that nobody really knew what was going to happen. We're in the middle of this economic situation. So I, I had a chat with with Karen Lush at, at the league office at the time. I, I think I was still in Chicago when this all happened. And we said, why don't we live tweet it? <laughs> and we did. And, and, you know, funny enough, our account very quickly grew from zero to 250,000 followers, wow. which at the time was, was, I mean, even today, that would be a lot, yeah. right? And, and back then it was, it was unbelievable. So, so we created this kind of community around the league and, and kind of around women's soccer, that was, it was loud and proud. Like people were really, really engaged and we offered them content and access through these social channels that, that they didn't ever have before. And I think that that has been consistent with the development of the industry, right? That we're always trying to offer through social media or, or just digital technologies, we're offering new things all the time, right? But but it's up to the content creator to figure out how to use it in an effective manner that actually, you know, gets people interested. So yeah, I think there was a really authentic community that formed around women's soccer at that time. I think that's one of the reasons why we see the women's soccer um, space is so highly engaged even today yeah, there's a yeah. sense of of ownership and community that and and i think i don't know if it's thankfulness that we can get information through social media where we couldn't get it in other places before but i don't know if i like that word because it's not it's it's mm-hmm. i mean it, like fans deserve the content right like it's not like they're but gratefulness i don't know like we yeah. like we 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 as women's soccer fans rally around that like we can get information and i think it's it's also driven by the players are being are so um, open and receptive and and engaging on social platforms, like willing to have conversations with anybody in ways that I don't think had been experienced in sport before. So it feels foundational to women's yeah, football. Absolutely, I do want to come and talk to you a bit more about that. And I guess you you then moved to work at Major League Soccer, uh, like equivalent of the Premier League over here. So what was your role there in terms of uh, or the role you progressed through to there? Yeah, well, I listen, I was laid off from WPS in 2010 when the league was on its way to folding, right? So we had 12 league office staff. They condensed it down to like five. I lost my job. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do uh, at the time, but I knew that I loved the business of soccer. I loved digital media and and I had built relationships now across the industry, Right. And so in, in 2010, um, a guy called Chris Schlosser at, at MLS called me up and we had a great conversation about the future of, of digital in, in, in MLS and how it could, um, you know, it could, again, be foundational to growing the game here in America So and, and growing fandom. So again, keep in mind, our challenge here is actually building the fan base, um, less about participation, right? So Chris just had this amazing sensibility that, that digital and social could, could be, you know, visionary pieces of, of building a professional sports league. So I was quick to align with him. We started building the social media strategy for MLS 
we had this small little team out West. I kind of joined that team. And a couple of years later, um, in 2012, they, they offered me the full-time position to move to New York as the director of social media. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where it started. And then my role certainly evolved when I was at MLS. <laughs> I went from director of social media to overseeing social and CRM, which meant I was overseeing like our email marketing and direct to fan um, communication. So like mobile alerts, you know, text messagey kind of things, plus the email, plus the social, delivering the right content on the right platform at the right time. So, so my role evolved into social and CRM. And then kind of evolved from that even to helping our clubs very specifically. So when I was my last couple of years at MLS, I was the vice president of fan engagement, which meant that I was really working hand in hand with our clubs to help them build their fan bases in their in their local markets. So um, it still included digital and, and, and social media marketing, but it was certainly much more um, extensive beyond the digital environment to, to in in stadium and and print and and all those kind of things like how do you build your fan base and and how do you build a brand that fans identify with and and fall in love with and is there a difference do you feel in the way um the clubs needed to engage with their female fans versus their male fans in in our in the way we did our research we looked at fan needs so we were really focused on the needs of consumers basically what would entice them to become a fan of football is it the environment in the stadium? Is it knowing the songs and chants when you go in? Is it identifying, is it having great food at the venue? Is it amazing access to media, amazing broadcasts, for example? So the way we looked at it was that fans have needs and sure they might they might be different based off gender, um, but it wasn't the focus of our research. I will say though, that it is important that that we do think and have considerations for gender specific needs in sporting environments, right? So safety, like your parking lots need to have lights so that when female fans are leaving a game, um, they're safe or you have security or female sized jerseys. So you're not always thinking in the context of, of men, but fans are fans. And what drives us to fandom is, is what we focused on um, at MLS. You then moved on to your current position as the Chief Women's Officer at FIFA Pro. So can you tell us a little bit more about that organization and, and its role within the world of soccer? Well, I loved, I absolutely loved my time at MLS. And I, I really think that league is is doing really special things. And they're a leader around the world in, in so many ways. Uh, for me, I decided it was time to explore a couple things. I wanted to, to think about global football. I was really interested in Europe. I really wanted to live in Europe. I always told myself when I left women's football and went to the men's game, I think I had a little bit of like guilt about it. I, you know, I'm a woman and I feel this, this compelling draw to growing women's sports. So I always said, you know, when, when the women's game was at a place where I felt that my knowledge and experience would be of great value, that I wanted to be back in the game. So part of what I was doing when I was at MLS was learning, learning, absorbing knowledge, absorbing learn, not like information about how do you grow a fan base? How do you, you know, how do you drive digital revenue? How do you, how do you, how do we think about needs, needs-based organizations? Um, you know, and, and I wanted to come back to the women's game and really give back through, through that lens, but also I wanted to learn more. When I left MLS, I went. I ran the London Marathon, which, by the way, is unbelievable. I what an amazing! I ran it with Katie Chapman. Oh wow! Actually. Oh, we ran the London Marathon together, and there were moments, there were moments where, uh, you know, she was she was in a bit of pain, and I was like, "Come on, Katie!" And then towards <laughs> the end, it was I think the last probably thirty minutes. She I don't know how she kicked it into like high gear, and I, she was I was huffing and puffing and complaining at her the whole time but we uh we we crossed the finish line together so what a, i mean what a powerful amazing, experience isn't it? to be able to run a marathon with katie chapman it's like it's like a badge of honor on my chest for the rest <laughs> of my life you know <laughs> actually you know what actually wait but i tell you katie because she's in the she was in the celebrity group right we ran for um plan uk so we ran for charity um and she was in the celebrity group so she, katie got put into the into the shoot like 
30 minutes ahead of me. So and I was back with the riffraff, you know, back in like group six or something. So Katie took off and there's no cell phone <laughs> service. So she takes off running, uh, you know, and we were due to run together. I call, she called me, I think she was around mile two. She called me and I was still in the pen waiting to go. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, Katie, you got to wait for me. I said, you got to stop, pull over at mile three. I think our, our lanes merge and, and wait for me. I'll be there in a half hour. And Katie, no questions asked. Katie said, no problem. I'll see you there. Oh. So Katie Chapman, I actually might've been mile four. So Katie Chapman, bless her. She pulls over, stops her run at mile four. I'm like, cause I'm almost in tears. I don't want to run the marathon alone. Like I need <laughs> Katie to help, you know? So she pulls over, she waited, she waited, she'd run four miles, pulled over, waited for me for maybe a half an hour or something like that wow. to catch up. And I was like, I was like, my heart was, was exploding with like both, I was sad and happy and I felt awful and grateful all at the same time. <laughs> but I was sprinting. I was sprinting to try and get to Katie who was waiting for me. I was running like, normally I run a 10 minute mile. Right. And I was running like an eight minute mile. I was huffing, I was huffing. So what, the moment I see her, I get this huge cramp. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm at mile four in the London marathon hunkered over. And I've just met up with Katie Chapman, the most decorated athlete in, 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 in British football. And I'm ready to run a marathon with her. I'm like, Oh no, this is going to be bad. <laughs> so anyway, we end up, she, you know, she takes it easy with me for a little bit. I get rid of my cramp and boom, we're out the shoots. But um, yeah, that was my marathon with, with Katie Chapman. <laughs> She's the most amazing, thoughtful, compassionate person I've ever met in all my life. And, uh, and, and it was, it was, a, it was a blessing to run with her. So um, anyway, that's a, such a, a side note. But. I love every question. There's a story. There's a story in every answer. It's fantastic. So did you move to Europe? <laughs> so I run the London Marathon and then I book an Airbnb in Paris. I talked to FIFA. I was helping FIFA with the Women's World Cup um, conference. Sarai, who's the chief women's football officer at FIFA, decided she had this. She had this idea to integrate social media into the Women's World Cup conference. They hold this big conference right before the World Cup um, kicks off. It's kind of in conjunction with their Congress, you know, where they do their their governance and elections and stuff. They have a women's football conference. So she hired me as a as a consultant, and I. Um, for the Women's World Cup, I was on stage the whole time helping manage the social media conversation that was happening around this conference. And we had this big stage behind us and we would put, you know, tweets I've seen up the videos. as they were coming in. I've seen the videos. Yeah. You're kind of comparing yeah. it. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was so I was in I was in Paris helping them and then I just booked this Airbnb and stayed there and traveled and went to all the games and and was networking. I think that's one of the things, maybe a good takeaway for people who are switching jobs or, or thinking where to go is like, just network your socks off, like go meet people, be in the places where the people you want to work with are, right? You don't have to know what the job is. You just have to know where to be to figure out what the job is. I've never had a job anyone before me had. Every job I've ever taken outside of coaching was new. So whether I was launching a company, I was the head of website marketing and camp, social media, this, that, and the other. I wasn't sure what the job was, but I knew all those things, women's football, global environment, you know, so of course it made sense for me to be at the World Cup. Yeah, so I go to France and then that's where I met Caroline Johnson, who was actually a goalkeeper at the Chicago Red Stars back in WPS, but she and I talked about Thief Pro and about um, Thief Pro's intention to to hire a, a head of women's football. So you know, that conversation just kind of led to to me meeting Jonas Bear Hoffman, who's our general secretary, and talking about, you know, what does the future of representation for female athletes, female soccer players look like around the world? And what are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And, and how do we make sure that, that the women have the, the support and resources that, that they need to compete at, at an elite level, right? How do we make the Women's World Cup 2023 the next level from 2019, which was, which was where we were and make sure that, you know, make sure women aren't sleeping two to a room or they're not traveling coach class to get to the, the premier global event in the world. Right. So these were the kind of, of conditions conversations we started to have. And it just, it just really resonated with me, this part of the industry where, you know, I know what soccer gave me as, as a kid. And, and I felt that, as an adult, it was still continuing to give to me. And so I saw this environment developing for female elite athletes where they weren't supported in, in the ways that, that they needed. And the opportunity to be at Thief Pro and, and do just that um, was incredibly compelling. So yeah, so, so I, I took this job, Chief Women's Football Officer. I moved to Amsterdam 
I, I went on when I went on my interview, of course, stayed on a houseboat in downtown Amsterdam. And how do you not fall in love when you have cute little duckies, you know, outside your window every morning? <laughs> and I mean, it was it was unbelievable. Amsterdam is so super cool. So yeah, so I moved to Europe and uh, and took the job. How were women represented via FIFPro before you took that role? So you've said how things have changed, but it was a new role. So was there a, a new recognition that women needed that support through FIFPro? Well, it's been, I think it's been a process over time um, at FIFPro, both at the global level with the members, which is all of the unions. So for example, in England, the PFA is our, our member in England, okay. the MLSPA here in the United States, the PFA Australia, right? So the UNFP, which is the, the union in France. So there's, there's unions all over the world that are all members of FIFPro. And it's been an evolution, I think, the representation of, of women within within even the union movement and, and what that looks like is still continuing to grow. Previously, it, it wasn't a, a rule that you had to represent female athletes, female professional athletes in your country as a union, and now it is. So they're evolving policy and governance from a gender, you know, equality perspective. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. And I think even in this past month, the membership has taken some really great strides to push that forward. So we've now implemented, you know, gender diversity quotas on our board. Um, We're working with Women in Football, a UK-based organization, which you're quite familiar with, to develop uh, an onboarding program called Ready to Board. So we just closed the applications for that. And we, at first we were like, oh my God, is anyone going to apply for this? Applications were off, off the charts. We had so many people apply for this program, like a board leadership program for women among many, many other diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives we're taking both internally and externally. So it's becoming part of our DNA. I think the like gender inclusion and, and, and really driving the women's agenda Again, both at a global level and, and among our members, but it's an evolution. It's it's certainly an evolution. I think we've taken a lot of time to self reflect as an industry, as an organization, and recognize where where we've fallen short and and make changes and make changes. So yeah. Last year, FIFA Pro issued the Raising Our Game report, which charts the economic evolution of the women's professional soccer. So can you just share a couple of the key findings from that with us? Yeah, let me tell you about raising our game report. So the way it's structured, and I would encourage anyone listening to go on fiefpro.org and download the raising our game report. Uh, so the report itself really looks at a couple things. It looks at the economics of women's football. And we did our research in coordination with KPMG football. <laughs> really, it details the last known economic position of women's football before the pandemic. So how powerful is this? Actually, when we talk about, you know, not letting women's football fail or making sure we continue the rise or, or not letting the pandemic kind of interfere in the growth of women's football, we, we like, like we have the, we have the, uh, I know everyone's listening, but I'm just pulling up <laughs> on the video, like in my hands, I keep this, then pretty sure I keep it like stuck in my shirt, erasing our game report. Like we have the industry benchmark on where women's football was before the pandemic. And it's the economics. It's also what the players said. So we surveyed players around the world and asked them, you know, what what they believe is important in the conditions for the growth and development of elite level athletes and performance. And then we set some recommendations going forward. And in particular, there's two areas where where we um, have focused much of our work after you know, after publishing the report, one is on international match conditions. So like I alluded to, right, how do we make 2023 the most, uh, you know, the best experience and environment for professional female athletes? And, And that includes some of the things I talked about, housing, accommodation, transportation, staff, equality in in the number of of staff that get to travel, for example. But it also looks at domestic environments. So what are the labor standards in a domestic environment that that are that are important to put in place? And 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 how do we think about those in yeah, in labor? Like how are you thinking about women footballers as workers? And what are the rights of of a female footballer who who this is this is her job that's her income and how are we thinking about about her rights as a worker in in relation to that rather than you know any any other any other approach you might take to to women's football so uh, yeah so that's raising our game it's really um, it's really women's football is labor and the economy I guess the biggest takeaway for me 
going through the process of writing that report with a woman called Caitlin Fisher and, and Caroline Janssen and, and others who all who are all big parts of, of putting that together, is that as the economy of women's football grows, we we can't overlook the conditions of the workers within that. If the economy grows and women's football continues to see increased broadcast and ratings and 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 revenues, that's amazing and great. But you'll leave behind the workers if you don't care for their environment and for 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 their conditions, and vice versa. If you if you are only focused on the player conditions and not considering the e- the economics, and you can't afford the conditions, and and you know, you, your league won't survive, right? So it's this it's this given give and take push and pull that's it can sometimes be really challenging but i think is is probably really really healthy for us to have that dialogue and you alluded there to covid and clearly it has had a huge negative impact on the women's game especially in comparison to the men's and much of which you've reported and i was shocked to read that worldwide at the professional level nearly half of all female players have seen their pay cut or or suspended so clearly the sport's in quite a precarious place but where do you see the bright spots and i guess that hope for the future as we we come out of this pandemic i think women's football over time has proven its resilience and its innovation. Even as I talked to you about what we did in 2008 with with Twitter, because nobody else was was using a platform like that, like we found ways to innovate to get around the challenges. I think that that is one of our greatest strengths, both as women. I think as women, we find ways um, because we have had to throughout history. Uh, But I think in women's football in particular, it's an industry that has found its way through innovation. So whether that means new types of broadcast arrangements, digital distribution of of rights, like you've seen the FAWSL and the international distribution of of their women's matches, um, that's something that happened during the pandemic. Right. I mean, that demonstrates investment and innovation in women's football during a pandemic. We also saw the Italian government finally approve the formation of, of women's football to be professional in in Italy, which now allows you know those women to to see all of the rights and benefits of being a professional athlete, but being recognized as, as workers in that country in a professional context. So they did that in the middle of a pandemic. Right. Here in the United States, the NWSL hosted the first sporting event to like the first event after the pandemic in the Challenge Cup. Uh, here in, in the United States, they hosted it in Utah. And during the tournament, they didn't have a single case of, of COVID. What I think is so compelling about that one is they worked hand in hand with the union, the NWSLPA here in the United States, to um, to make sure that players' conditions were were cared for. For example, um, if a player had to bring their their child, there were opportunities for to bring um, you know a caretaker into the bubble. For example, contract commitments, health insurance, things like that that the union negotiated as part of that tournament. And the tournament was amazing. <laughs> yeah. So so and that was in the middle of a pandemic. So again, like it's it's these these really cool, bright moments, as you said, of, of, in, of innovation and, and challenging the systems and saying, you know what, we're not going to take defeat. And we are, we are going to rise above and women's football, women's football and footballers deserve, deserve us, you know, rolling up our sleeves and, and making it happen. So, yeah. And I'm keen to, I guess, circling back almost to coaches. You were also president of the I don't, it's the National Soccer Coaches Association of America. Is it the NSCAA? I wouldn't know how to pronounce it correctly. Yeah, the NSCAA. It was um, <laughs> was our it, yeah. It's our acronym. You know, it's, it's acronym soup out here in in, in <laughs> football. So, um, but we we've rebranded to United Soccer Coaches. Actually, that's easier. So yeah, so I was the president. I served on the board for. 10 years. I was a, before that I was the chair of our women's committee for maybe seven years. Yeah. I mean, I love governance. I love governance. I love policy development. And so during my time, during this 10 years, I remember early on in my days, I was, you know, the only woman in the room in a lot of environments, whether it was a coaching education course or the boardroom. And I, I remember thinking that like, we need to figure out how to change this. So, uh, yeah, I started, I started working on the board and figuring out how to do it. Like, how do you change policy? How do you affect governance structures that seem so institutionalized that they aren't changeable, but actually they all are. 
policy is only as good as the people who implement it at the end of the day. So um, during those 10 years, it wasn't just me. I mean, it was a, a combination of people, but we hired the first female CEO in um, the history of, of the organization, but also um, membership organizations of U.S. soccer that, that I'm aware of. We restructured our board. We previously had 18 or 19 people on the board and it was constituent based, right? So we had a black coaches representative, a Latin coaches representative, a women's representative, which I served in that role for a couple of years, a high school, a college, a youth, you know, so it was all based on constituency. But what we wanted to do was find a way where constituent voices could be part of the decision-making process and a, a holistic view on, on, on leadership and governance. So rather than them being so dedicated to one seat in the boardroom, if that makes sense. So we, we, we changed the landscape. We went from 18, 19 people to 10 on the board, shifted from the constituent model to a president, three vice presidents, a secretary, and then three um, at large positions, which were based on like business, legal and, and finance or whatever kind of combination the, the organization needs at the time. That was a big deal for us because we then created a series of committees and councils. One was the advocacy advocacy council, which is really active in in um, all of those kind of constituent groups that I that I talked about, and they have a seat on the board, the advocacy council as a whole. But we also created a nominations and elections committee, which helped us identify, recruit, and identify candidates who were diverse, who would run for office of United Soccer Coaches. So I was the fifth female president in 75 years. Since me, I, my, I was the president in 2016. Since me, there's now four, I believe, four females in line to become the president of the association. In addition to, to you know, different, different diverse backgrounds and, and ethnic backgrounds and, and ages, different regions represented now across the country in the leadership structures of, of the organization. So for me, that's been a huge learning learning experience. I feel like it's a, a bit of my legacy from, from my time on, on the board there, but I hope that, you know, I hope there's some learning there that we can take to impact governance structures in, in other areas to ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion across football. And in terms of on the ground, uh, globally, does soccer have more female coaches, do you think, than other sports? Oh, no, 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 definitely not. No, the number of women coaching is 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 tiny. I don't, I, you know, I wouldn't have the percentage at hand, but... Um, Will that change? I hope so. Um, I know U.S. soccer in, the, in America is thinking about, you know, how to, how to grow um, the opportunities for women coaching. You know, I actually was doing... I did a web, a web video chat for International Women's Day. And Sarah Walsh, who is in Australia, she's a former player. She's running the legacy campaign for the Australian Federation coming off 2023. You know, she's really focused on the growth of females in coaching and women coaching. So, you know, I think you find these pockets where, you know, there's a focus on that, but I do think it's going to take some, some institutional, um, broad sweeping change in order in order to do that um and some recognition that that as a woman you can coach males and females and um i think that's a really important thing for us to talk about and have a real honest conversation about about the needs of of women in coaching and you know how do we best su support that um going forward so you know it's interesting in america you know title IX created all these opportunities for more for more girls to play and at the beginning we saw a lot of on balance there were there were a lot of female coaches part of the growth of of women's so collegiate soccer in america has actually created an influx of men coaching women's soccer in america because um, there's opportunity there right i mean there's there's money. there's money yeah there's money in it and so it's actually changed the the ratios to where there's actually more men coaching in women's soccer today than there was 20 years ago which is in on balance a really kind of interesting thing i think we have to we have to look at it's a it's a big one it's a big challenge i think it's a, a really important challenge um that we collectively need to 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 take on as an as an industry and and you know coaches collectively thinking about about what are the, the, the rights and opportunities for, for coaches as an industry? And what does that look like today? But what does that look like 10 years from now as, as the coaching industry evolves and, and develops as well? So what are, the, what are the systems and structures in place to support their needs?
Another whole podcast. Mm. Um, <laughs> so just finally, you've clearly had huge impact in the roles you've held, but what does the, the future hold for you? What more would you like to achieve within your career, do you think? You know, I never really think about like what I want to achieve in terms of like KPIs, uh, key performance <laughs> indicators, or like I never think about what I want my job to be. One year, I was at a U.S. soccer AGM, uh, annual general meeting, like our general assembly. And there was a woman on our board called Donna Shalala. She's she's an American politician, really recently represented a region in Florida. Um, but she had served as the Secretary of Health and Human Services um, uh, at one point in her career. And anyway, I thought, wow, this woman is somebody I really... And now she's on the U.S. soccer board. I thought, wow, she's somebody I really want to... I really want to pick her brain, you know, I want to, I want her advice on my career and, and, you know, where to go. And so I asked her, I asked her to, to a cup of coffee in the, in the hotel, I got this little awkward table where, you know, all, everyone was walking by us. And, you know, I said, yeah, I'm not sure where I want to go with my career next and what to do. And I expected this like amazing, like soliloquy of, of recommendations and how to think about my career and whatever. And she said, listen, she said, if it's something that, that, that you like doing, if you think it's fun, do it. And that was like, kind of it. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, oh, it's disappointing. Like, just if it's fun, do it. Like, okay. You get like woman who's, you know, been the, the designated survivor for the U S government at one point, like you're legit and that's your advice. And I, I was like, okay, right. But I walked away and I thought, actually, actually sometimes less is more. And that advice is really, really compelling. So for me, I've thought a lot about what brings me joy. Like what makes it fun? Where do I feel compelled, right? So for me, I love learning. I really love learning. I love I love meeting new people. I love being in dynamic environments, um, but I also love helping and teaching. So like that learning also goes that I, I'm, I'm a helper and I'm a teacher. And so with the sport of, of soccer and and what it's given me in my career, right? In my life, as we started this podcast, right? With the impact that soccer had on me as a kid and hopping, you know, palm tree shade and, and all that and going to camps. And like, for me, it was, it was community. It was growth environment, all those things. How can I continue to provide that for others in the industry, whether it's women or men, women's football, men's football, um, like the growth of the game, the growth of opportunity within the game to, perform at an elite level, I think is, is a condition that I want to help create for everyone. So whether it's a, somebody in business, you know, somebody who's a podcaster, somebody who is, you know, a player, elite level player, whether they're an elite coach or, you know, an, an, an amateur, like how do we create the best environment in football for people to be successful so that as a sport, as an industry, we can continue to, to grow. And yeah, so I, I, I don't have a specific answer for, for that other than what brings me joy is like helping others succeed. Like I, that's why I love cakes, right? I make cakes because I love that when I give a cake to somebody, it's like a special mo I see them smile and it's this moment of joy and like shared experience that you can't get in any other way. And so to share joy and drive opportunity and growth for me would be how I see the future of, of my career. But there's no title to that. And there's no end goal. There's no end goal. It's life is a journey. And it's like what you learn along the way that makes it special. I so enjoyed talking to Amanda. She's clearly had such an impact on the women's game. I really hope that we get to meet in person at some point in the future. To hear the stories of other incredible females trailblazing away in football, our previous interviews include the likes of Jill Scott, Steph Horton, Kelly Smith and Rachel Yankee. If you'd like to know more about the work I do, including the Women's Sport Collective, a free network for any woman working in sport, please visit fearlesswomen.co.uk. This is where you can find out more about all 58 of my incredible guests from this and the previous series. You can also listen to all the podcasts from the website or you'll find the Game Changers on all the usual podcast platforms. 
Thanks again to Barclays for their incredible support for The Game Changers and also to Sam Walker, our executive producer, and Rory Ascri, who does a great job on sound production. Come and say hello on social media where you'll find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Game Changers or at Sue Anstis. Next week, for the final episode in this series, I'm talking to the one and only Lucy Bronze. One of the world's leading female professional players, Lucy was UEFA Women's Player of the Year in 2019 and in 2020 was named FIFA Women's Best Player of the Year. We talk about Lucy's journey to the top of the women's game, the obstacles she's had to overcome and what she's learnt about herself and the English system in the process. Lucy shares so much in this interview, so please do subscribe now and you won't miss it. Just finished my GCSEs and England had a programme where the players went to Loughborough and you study. Mm. I didn't go because I wasn't good enough. Well, I, I was deemed not to be good enough by England. They had rang my mum up and said, no, Lucy's not coming, she's not good enough. At that point, all my friends are going to Loughborough to train and to be full-time athletes. And I'm thinking I'm going to drop behind. So that was where it was like, right, we're going to go to America. And if you can't have it in England, you'll do it somewhere else. Um, so off I went to America, uh, had a great time there, but then <laughs> improved there, got better there. England then rang me up again and said, if you're going to be in America, then we're just not going to pick you. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport. Mm-hmm.